Welcome to the Danilo Husser Struk Memorial Lecture for 2018. This is the 19th Danilo Husser Struk Memorial Lecture. I'm very proud of that. I am very grateful to the family for supporting us, for coming out to listen to the talks, and not least of all, for the family and the donors who provided the funds that make this event possible. The funds gathered created the Danilo Hussar Struk program in Ukrainian literature at the Canadian Institute of Ukrainian Studies, which is part of the University of Alberta. The program has the goal of supporting and popularizing scholarship on Ukrainian literature. And it honors my late colleague, Danilo Hussar Struk, who passed away prematurely 19 years ago, who was a prominent scholar in the Ukrainian community in Canada, who is probably best known as the editor of the Ukrainian Encyclopedia Project, but who was a professor of Ukrainian literature and language at the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures at the University of Toronto, and an avid fan of Ukrainian literature and promoting Ukrainian literature in an English-speaking world. And we continue to honor his memory with these annual lectures and with the other activities of the Struk program. This year's speaker is a historian, first and foremost, but he is a peculiar historian. He is, uh, all historians are peculiar if you study literature. In that, the particular, there, there are two characteristics of Professor Ekelczyk's scholarship that I want to focus on. One is that he concentrates on the 20th century. That is, his specialty is the 20th century and by and large Soviet Ukrainian history, something that not so many people in the West do. The second characteristic and what brings him here to our forum is that he is a historian of culture. His particular take on Ukrainian history in the 20th century is to focus on the cultural dimension, particularly the cultural dimension of Soviet ideological, political, historical space. And so what we will hear today is a talk about literary history by a historian who focuses on cultural history by and large. Professor Serhii Yakelchik is Professor of History and Slavic Studies at the University of Victoria. He is also, he is the paramount and chief Ukrainianist in all of Canada because he is the president of the Canadian Association for Ukrainian Studies. He is also a distinguished scholar with a great many publications. He has six monographs already, of which I want to mention three which are probably best known to you. Probably his best known work is a history of modern Ukraine, a history of Ukraine, Ukraine, Birth of a Nation, published by Oxford University Press in 2007, and already translated into five different languages. An earlier work of his that stems largely from his initial work as a scholar I should add that as a scholar, Professor Yekelchik begins his scholarly career in Ukraine. That is, he's born in Ukraine. He's a graduate of KU University. He was a graduate student in Academy of Sciences in Ukraine. The topics that he worked on as 
uh, as a graduate student, ended up turning into a volume called Stalin's Empire of Memory, Russian-Ukrainian Relations in the Soviet Historical Imagination, a monograph published by the University of Toronto Press. His most recent work, just to show you how productive he is and how au courant, is a book on the current situation in Ukraine, a book titled The Conflict in Ukraine, published by Oxford University Press in 2015. He is currently working on the Ukrainian Revolution, that is 1917 to 1920. But you didn't come here to listen to me, even if I am trying to give him some praise. You came to listen to a very dynamic speaker. And so I invite you to welcome Professor Sergei Thank you very much, Professor Tarnovsky, for your wonderful introduction. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, it's a rainy day, and I just took a walk from my hotel, and I got lost at some point, and my GPS warned me at that very moment as I got lost that the institute might be closed by the time I arrive. So I was very <laughs> pleased to see that it was, in fact, not closed, and to see you all come here to listen to this uh, boring lecture. Um, it's fun to be appointed in two departments. I just want to follow up quickly on Maxim's introduction because I can always claim that I'm too busy in one of them to serve on various committees in the other. So being a historian in the Department of Slavic Studies and being a Slavist in the Department of History has numerous advantages in addition to interdisciplinarities that should immediately jump to your mind. Today, however, I'm going to talk about an event, a really charismatic event, a perhaps scandalous event, and its implications. I'm going to start by describing the event to you, then by drawing three or possibly four theoretical conclusions from it, introducing two puzzles in the meantime, and concluding with two separate epilogues. Um, I'll try to move quickly. If you cannot hear me well, please indicate so, and my voice usually carries on top of microphone and such. But who knows, this is Toronto. It's hot here and humid, right? And I live on the island where there's ocean on all sides and there are winds, all kinds of things. The event I'm going to talk about today happened on February the 12th, 1929. It was a cold winter day. Lots of snow, extremely cold. A few days before that, a delegation from Ukraine arrived in the capital of the Soviet Union, Moscow, by occupying uh, a special carriage in a train. This is 1929, when they arrived at the Kiev, uh, Kharkiv railway station. Kharkiv was the capital of Ukraine at the time, of course. They immediately realized that the carriage was, in fact, occupied by some other people who had to be kicked out in order for the Ukrainian delegation to, uh, to take their seats. The delegation was rather substantial. In addition to 40 or so writers, it also included some prominent theater and film directors, including Dovzhenko and Les Kurbas, and a few operatic stars, famous singers, who were supposed to represent the Ukrainian culture and perhaps perform at various concerts along the way. But the chief, the chief emphasis of the tour, the chief emphasis of the trip, was in fact squarely on literature. Therefore, we very often refer to this event as the meeting of Ukrainian writers with Stalin which, of course, needs to be immediately qualified. Not all the people in the audience were writers. Some of them were, in fact, party officials and state officials who worked closely with the Ukrainian writers. And as you're going to see soon, they asked some of the most provocative questions, which means that I need to remind you immediately. This is the very high end of the 1920s. It is still possible for the writers and people of art to act together with the officials, because very often these official, officials, they originate from the same circles of Ukrainian leftist parties, the borrowed beasts, um, who share the idea of, uh, of a socialist and yet powerful Ukrainian state. So these people are not necessarily, uh, not necessarily uh, the political watchers. They are actually part of the same audience, and they are going to disappear during the Great Terror as well. Further, 
Not all the trends in Ukrainian literature and culture are represented at this meeting in 1929. Some big names from the pre-revolutionary period are not invited, such as Sergei Efremov, for instance, a major literary critic, a high-standing academician member of the academy, um, who is nevertheless being criticized at that very moment and denounced for being Ukrainian nationalist. So you see, already as they travel to Moscow, they travel leaving behind in Kiev and Kharkiv other Ukrainian cultural figures who cannot possibly go because they are already being defined as enemies. So those who do go to Moscow are defined as fellow travelers or sympathizers of the Soviet regime. It is still possible in the 1920s, it will become nearly impossible in the 1930s to actually be engaged in a dialogue with the authorities in Ukraine. The price for that is a political one. They have to denounce Yefremov and others. They have to denounce the nationalist mistakes of Rushevsky and others. And there are also suspicious types, those the apolitical ones, especially the neoclassics, the rather influential school of Ukrainian literature, Mykola Zarov, Maxim Rilsky, they are not there, they are not invited. In fact, they are also being criticized and soon to be arrested uh, precisely for being apolitical, which of course means they are not Soviet. This brings me to the point of the weather when they arrive in Moscow. It's very cold. The Ukrainian delegation has to go immediately to the department store and to buy whatever hats are available there. And I imagine the selection was not very big because some memoirists, in fact, comment on all the Ukrainians wearing similar hats. It's not all. Apparently, some of them immediately have their wallets stolen by a Moscow pickpocketing crowd. They also discover that as they travel to Moscow, bread coupons were being introduced in the capital. It's impossible to buy bread. Fortunately, fortunately, on the same train, a special administrator of the, uh, of the Ukrainian cultural establishment travels with his oven supply of sandwiches, water, and vodka is not on the list, but I assume it was, in fact, being consumed on this trip as well. So they come from Ukraine bringing their oven food. An interesting take, right? And an ironic one as well, knowing what is going to happen in a few years. They know they're going to meet with Stalin. Uh, they are told apparently one day before the trip, they are gathered at the lobby of the hotel to discuss the questions. The questions they come up with are open-ended, friendly. Let's talk about the difference between the nation and the nationality. What is going to be the Soviet policy towards the languages? How do you envisage the rights of the Republic and such? To give Comrade Stalin an opportunity without being offended to, give, to present a long speech on, on this. When, however, they arrive in Kremlin for the meeting, it turns out it is Kaganovich who is meeting them, not Stalin. And Kaganovich invites all of them to sit around a very, two actually, very long tables. Somehow, strangely, none of them allowed to occupy the first four seats on the left side. That's your signal. Don't sit there. Um, and Kaganovich immediately distributes sandwiches, in fact, with caviar. In a hungry Moscow, people are, of course, shocked and immediately, actually, they're hungry. There is a part of the memoir preserved in the archive of Volodymyr Sosura, and I can think of no other Ukrainian poet of the time capable of writing this. And, of course, Sosura died in the Soviet Union, right? He didn't live to see independent Ukraine. And he says, I was so hungry. I was listening to Comrade Stalin, but really focusing on my sandwiches. And I felt embarrassed because of that, because I was so hungry. He's the only one who could say this and get away with it, really. Um, so they're hungry. They're eating. Uh, Kaganovich speaks to them in a very poor Ukrainian, but they're actually shocked he speaks in Ukrainian. It didn't happen all that often when Kaganovich was serving in Ukraine as the general secretary of the Communist Party there. That is a good signal. That's a good signal. And suddenly, in the middle of Kaganovich's speech about our achievements and small problems and our wonderful plans for the future, a small side door opens probably just like this one, <laughs> yeah. and without bringing any attention, uh, uh, somebody walks into the room, sits at the side of the table, uh, puffing his pipe. This is, of course, Comrade Stalin. All of them are shocked, of course, everybody who met Stalin was immediately shocked how small he was in stature. Not everybody realizes, because Kaganovich is speaking, and you're supposed to be paying, take, paying attention, like you're paying attention to me now, right? <laughs> that somebody entered the room and sits there, once they realize, 
they realize also there should be an appropriate reaction. This is already a transition to Stalinist society. What is the appropriate reaction? Immediately, all of us should rise and start applauding. This is what they do. This is what they do. And even so, Kaganovich's speech was interrupted right in the middle of it. Nobody cares to hear the end of this speech. It is actually Stalin who starts a conversation with the Ukrainian writers by inviting them to submit written questions. But of course, you know, they already met in the hotel lobby. They have the three nice open-ended questions, which are immediately given to him. He then goes into a long and boring speech, which fortunately was preserved in the archives because at some point when the collected works of Comrade Stalin were being prepared for publication, it was considered for possible inclusion. In the end, it was not included in this particular volume of his collected works, but it was preserved unedited in the archives. Unedited is a plus and a minus when you are a literary historian or a historian of literature. And we'll see what, what, what I mean by this. So after, after this theoretical introduction, which is rather long and boring, and some Ukrainian writers apparently realize that Stalin makes a distinction between nation and the nationality based on possessing the state or contiguous territory, and in this sense, Ukraine perhaps is not a nation but only a nationality in his classification. But it's long, but they don't interrupt him. But then the conversation actually turns to other questions from the room, and this is where things start going wrong. From moment one, um, two things be immediately become apparent that Comrade Stalin is not prepared for the meeting with Ukrainian writers. This is rather uncharacteristic for him. You know, of course, from the subsequent history of Ukrainian literature that so many ideological campaigns and denunciations and arrests took place after Comrade Stalin opened the issue of the journal and thought, oh, wait a minute. There is a poem by Sosura here, which I missed, because it was published in 1944. But this is now 1952. It appears in translation. This is how the entire campaign starts in 1952. This is how all the Ukrainian writers across the country have to engage in self-criticism to discover nationalism in their hearts, because Stalin simply opened the journal and found fault with Ukrainian literature. But as I said, uncharacteristically for him, he is not prepared. And it also seems, and I think it's more productive perhaps to use this category, he is not interested in the Ukrainian writers in front of him, as writers, as producers of culture. There could be several reasons for that, and I'm going to elaborate on them in my talk. But perhaps most importantly, what you, what you see from, from this dialogue which emerges um, among them is that it is very clearly political. It is political in that the writers ask political questions. Very famously, Valerian Polishuk, the Ukrainian poet who is going to perish in the Great Terror, asks Stalin whether it would be possible uh, to unite with the Ukrainian Republic the areas of the Russian Republic populated primarily by Ukrainians in Voronezh, Kursk Oblast, and the Kuban. That's a very charged political question, which Stalin actually doesn't want to answer. He tries to evade it, to dodge the question. He says, this is not related to the fate of Ukrainian culture at all. But then Polishuk insists and others support him. What about the rights of ethnic Ukrainians living in the Russian Republic? Stalin has to go into a rather awkward explanation that in theory this is right, but in practice that would offend the Russians. A very interesting topic here, immediately. It would offend the Russians. And also, abroad, are making, they are making fun of us abroad because we are changing borders too often. An interesting suggestion from Stalin. He is guided by the interests of the Russians, not the Russian workers, actually, but the Russians in general. And somehow, he is influenced by what people abroad think of him. That's very strange. Um, but this is clearly political. And then when it is his turn to start asking questions to the writers, he wants to ask about Halachina about the part of Ukraine which is not in the Soviet Union yet. And that indicates to you that his interest towards this audience is not a literary one. He is not about to grab a pen and ask, as he is going to ask Dovzhenka in 1943, what did you mean by this sentence? Do you realize that you have deviated from the theory of class struggle? He is onto something else, something very interesting. He starts asking the Ukrainian writers about whether people in Halachina actually understand the Ukrainian language used in Veliko Ukraina. 
he doesn't use the term Velika Ukraina, but one of the functionaries in the room actually makes a suggestion. Comrade Stalin, it's Velika Ukraina. They are calling it Velika Ukraina. Because he seems to be confused about which of them is the most important politically and culturally part of Ukraine. He actually says, I had this impression from my pre-revolutionary days, from talking to somebody in 1904, 1902, that it was Halichina that actually introduced culture, that was the leading part of Ukraine. But if so, immediate implications would follow because, of course, Halichina is outside of the Soviet Union. It is there that the power of capitalists and nationalists still exists. That would immediately make all the writers in the audience potential spies, which is actually what is going to happen to them in 1933-34. And they are fighting back immediately on the issue of national pride and on the issue of being somehow subordinated to Holochina. They argue, no, 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 no. It's, it's not that. And actually, Andriy Khvile, who is the head of Agit Prop in Ukraine, the most important cultural official, says, Comrade Stalin, let me explain this misunderstanding. It's not that Holochina dictates to us. It is actually us who is leading the way. They are reprinting our works. Of course, they are misrepresenting us because we are a wonderful land of socialism and they are still suffering under, under the yoke of Polish lords and Ukrainian nationalists and etc. But we, we are the Ukraine. We are Velika Ukraina. And Stalin says, ah, okay, all right. That makes it even more interesting. It also means he is interested potentially in Poland, in foreign expansion, in encouraging irredenta, which is what is going to happen in 1939. But this is a tense political moment, right? Because he talks about the unity. They are actually arguing to him that Ukrainian culture is the same on both sides of the border. So you still have Shevchenko, and you have different interpretations, but you actually have the same ground. And this is if, if, you, if you advance into the period of mature Stalinism, this means trouble, real trouble, right? Um, as some of you perhaps know, uh, this infamous Stalinist campaign against the Jews in the late 1940s started with the fact that the Soviet uh, leadership realized that the state of Israel is out there. Therefore, the Soviet Jews are potentially disloyal because they would be loyal to the homeland abroad. And this is what Stalin is potentially going to establish in this particular case. He's actually asking Ukrainian writers, what is the relations to Galicia, to Galicia? So they are fighting back. But it's interesting that they are trying to bring, bring up the details of cultural life, of how Ukrainian culture, in fact, developed in Velika Ukraina, not in Pranchina, and how it was transferred to Holochina and perhaps corrupted there as well. But nobody is paying much attention because Stalin has pragmatic questions. Do they understand your language or do they have to translate? And then they, hope they have to go into yet another round of explanation. No, but the Ukrainian language has already been established. But he says, no, the Ukrainian language is still being polished, right? No, 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 it's not being polished has been established based on kiev poltava dialect. So he, he is into very pragmatic matters related to politics and international affairs, and the writers are immediately on their feet because not only, not only their sense of being cultural leaders um, uh, is, is, is injured, but also all of them are suddenly under suspicion that they are being led somehow by nationalists from abroad, from Poland. This is one awkward part of conversation, but this is not the only one. The writers and the cultural officials, in fact, arrive to this meeting with their own agenda. And it is the agenda which comes as a surprise to Stalin, because it was not on the list of questions given to him. But just before the meeting, they were led, the writers were led to a performance of Mikhail Bulgakov's very famous play, uh, The White Guard, known in the West as The White Guard, and Dni Turbinich in Russian. It is at this play, uh, ironically, uh, that the Ukrainian playwright Mikola Kulish has his wallet stolen by a pickpocket, which, as, as other members of the delegation joked, only made him confirm the fact that this is a really harmful play. And it is a really harmful play. Um, they are led there by a Moscow guide, the person who meets them at the railway station in Moscow, um, Platon Kerzhentsev, uh, is an important official related to proletarian culture movement in Russia in the 1920s, uh, he is one of very few officials of this movement who actually survived the Great Terror. He was dismissed in 1938, but died in his own bed uh, in 1940. He was famous for his fight with Bulgakov and, and his fight with uh, Russian theater figures who wanted to bring in um, the signpost writers, the writers who were not Soviet sympathizers, but who could see in the Soviet Union a uh, Russian Empire reborn. 
Okay? So the signpost movement, which actually resulted in quite a few uh, Russian writers coming back from immigration, um, suggested uh, in no uncertain terms that the Soviet Union was the successor of the Russian Empire. There is an immediate ideological connection here. If you are a Ukrainian official or a Ukrainian writer in the 1920s, that actually militates against all of your views. And all of your views are, of course, grounded also in party resolutions on the nationality issue. So the Ukrainian writers and officials did not really need to be provoked when they were led to the performance of this play. This is a play about a Russian monarchist family in Kiev in late 1918. When the Hetman regime is collapsing, uh, the Ukrainian troops are advancing, and some Russian officers and volunteers are trying to decide what to do. Fight, run away. Um, it's a powerful play. Uh, Bulgakov is, of course, a, a major Russian writer. But it is a powerful play written from the position of Russian chauvinism. Uh, a, a play which installs the concept, instills the concept of the Russian Empire. So the writers did not need any guidance from an important official of the Association of Proletarian Writers. They would hate it anyway. They hated it anyway. So they went, attended the performance. Of course, Kulish also had his wallet stolen. Uh, but they arrived to the meeting with Stalin essentially mad with a sentiment brewing in the middle, and it was bound to come to surface. And it did. Three separate occasions. When Stalin says, well, I think I'm done, I'm through, that's it. And then somebody from the audience says, but no, but we just went to the performance and it was outrageous. Are you aware of what is going on? Why is this being allowed in the Soviet Union? Aren't we supposed, and here they sound ideological, you have to sound ideological if you are a Soviet writer, aren't we supposed to fight both Ukrainian nationalism and Russian imperial chauvinism? We are doing our best to fight Ukrainian nationalism at home. We didn't bring Khvelevi, we denounced Khvelevi. We didn't bring Yefremov, we are fighting, writing articles against Yefremov. What about you? And you are supposed in the Russian Republic to also fight your own Yefremovs and Khvelevis, like Bulgakov is the best example of that. And then suddenly, Stalin goes on defensive, which is completely unjustifiable from any theoretical point of view to defend a white monarchist political cause. It's nearly impossible. The only argument he can use is that it is a play by the writer who is the enemy of the Soviet power. That much I'll grant you. But it is still a helpful play. In that, it ends with the triumph of the Bolsheviks. Some of you would immediately want to challenge me, saying, wait a minute, I read this play last week, I saw the film, it does not end with the triumph. Well, but of course the performance which they saw actually ended with the triumph of Bolshevism because the director, the theater director, smartly revised the end of the play. Mike, in making one of the most lovable characters in the play, uh, say that the Red Army is so great. I mean, nothing can possibly defeat the Red Army. And then, of course, some, uh, some protagonists are in embracing the Bolshevik cause and are prepared to join the Red Army. This is what happens in that, in the finale, in the end of the play, as it was performed there. And this is what Stalin is using to justify it. It's not in Bulgakov's text. But the Ukrainian writers and officials are fighting back, interrupting him three times to bring back this issue, to argue that this is monarchism coming back. This is nationalism. We have done things against precisely that deviation in our republic. And Stalin is using all kinds of arsenal, saying, you cannot apply political criteria to a play. <laughs> all his life, Stalin was applying political criteria to a play. Suddenly he said, no, they don't apply. You cannot say that this is a leftist or rightist play, because leftist and rightist are basically trends within our party. Of course they are, but you have been applying this very same criteria all the time. So this fight is going on and on and on until finally Kaganovich feels he needs to interject himself as an MC and say, are we here to talk about the white guard or something else? At which point, of course, the Ukrainian writers immediately come to their senses and Ostap Vishny as always says, oh, I have this petition about our housing co-op. If you could give us some money for, for a house we want to build and actually start dealing with practical issues. But just before this point comes, Stalin gets really upset, like really upset. At one point he says, so are you... Um, so you say that the portrayal of Ukrainians in this play is disgusting. They are portrayed as brutal, illiterate, uh, violent, and they say, yeah, this is what it is. And they were not like that. Somebody from the audience actually says, 
Colonel Bal Batun was uh, graduated from the Academy of General Staff of the Imperial Russian Army. He was not a brute. He was a Tsarist officer. This is, of course, untrue. First of all, the real, the real protagonist's name was Bolbachan. He was a captain. He never went to the Academy of General Staff. But it gives you an interesting idea. They're actually using all kinds of arguments to say, no, wait a minute, these were also educated people. Because you are really reproducing here a familiar imperial dichotomy of the civilized metropolitan area and the uncivilized periphery, which needs to be governed, civilized, classified, and taught how to live and how to think about themselves. This is what is going on there. So the Ukrainian writers, in other words, and officials are misled. They arrive to this meeting being misled, thinking that that would be an opportunity for them to engage in promoting their agenda. They have multiple legitimate grievances. As some of you probably know, um, the chauvinistic approach persists in Soviet literature in the 1920s, before Maxim Gorky returns uh, triumphantly to the Soviet Union to see, to see cities and avenues named after him in his lifetime, too. Um, he, of course, uh, in 1926, refuses to allow the translation into Ukrainian of his most politically correct novel, Mother. Right? He says that there is no point of translating it into Narecia, the dialect, because, because languages are going to merge, and it doesn't make sense uh, on our way to socialism to develop uh, uh, dialects. Because the Ukrainian writers are outraged, they make a big deal out of it, they publish information about this uh, incident, and there are other events. But there are also, of course, there are also, of course uh, moments when they do not realize that this is not an opportunity. And this tells you something, right? Ten years down the road, let's say, in 1939, no Ukrainian writer or official would even think of interrupting Comrade Stalin three times to bring up this politically controversial issue. That would not happen. They would be trained by them, of course, by arrests, concentration camps, campaigns of denunciation, all kinds of things that come with mature Stalinism. But this is the moment of transition. And that brings me to my third point, the moment of transition. Transition from what to what? The 1920s are an interesting period in that it is possible, as I said at the very start of my talk, to identify with the program of Ukrainization. Uh, people, in fact, leave Haldachina because it's under the Polish rule and go back to Soviet Ukraine because they believe in an opportunity to be building Ukrainian culture there. Most of them are going to be arrested and perish in Stalinist concentration camps. But they do go there, right? So it's not just the locals, it's actually the foreigners who think that this is the moment of transition, of building, building the nation. But the transition in 1929 is actually from that moment to something else, to the Stalinist version of cultures. The Stalinist version of culture, of ethnic culture, is um, sanitized and ethnicized in that the political component is completely removed from it. As you see, I have defined, I have started by defining this 1929 event as explicitly political. There will be nothing political in subsequent appearances of Ukrainian writers, uh, cultural officials, singers, and dancers in Moscow. They would perform, in fact, operas, ballets, lots of hopak dancing, and apparently they believe Comrade Stalin likes hopak. By the 1950s, they would say, oh, but this Comrade Stalin has a favorite Ukrainian song, just make sure you perform this favorite Ukrainian song. Um, what kind of culture is that? It's a safe a culture in a safe ethnographic mode in which you have monuments to Shevchenko that are kind of very large, very Soviet in every city, but the political concept of the Ukrainian nation is not operable. You cannot. Those who tried operating it uh, have been removed from this society. So it is a, tra a transition from a model of Ukrainian culture which is explicitly political to the culture which is going to be safely ethnographic in an interesting way. This moment of transition is represented by different selections of Ukrainian cultural figures who go to Moscow in 1929 and in 1936. In 1936, this event is already codified as Decada uh, of Ukrainian culture in Moscow. And it actually does not uh, bring that many writers to Moscow at all. The number of writers is actually very limited but the number of opera singers and hopak dancers increased many times. 
This is the moment in 1936 when the uh, opera Zaporozhye Zadunaya, Ulaka Artemovskoho, suddenly becomes the representation of Ukrainian culture. If you want to celebrate Ukrainian culture, this is a 19th century little Russian kind of musical comedy for you, safely enjoyed by the royal family in the 1880s, safely enjoyed by Soviet officials in the late 1930s. It's a performative, very visual culture, but it also um, is related by a variety of connections to 19th century little Russian identity not to the modern political Ukrainian identity which was in existence in the 1920s when the Ukrainian film studios could actually have an argument with the Russian film studios and when the Ukrainian Vufku film produ production would actually have a trade war and a blockade with the Russian film producers. So they would have to negotiate about the release of the movies and things like that. Right? Or, of course, in the 1920s, 1929, Ukraine still has an official representation in Moscow which is not quite an embassy but it's post pretzto which makes it sound almost like a Soviet embassy. So there is a political component there, which is going to be gone in the 1930s completely. So it's kind of interesting that in 1929, you don't get to hear much about singing and dancing hopak. In fact, dancing hopak was probably be perceived by, by all these writers as an affront against the new notion of Ukrainian identity. Hopak dancers, they are left in imperial past the safe entertainment of Tamris times. In addition to writers, many of whom are sophisticated modernists, many of whom either openly or implicitly endorsed Hvilovy's call away from Moscow towards Europe as a school of culture. In addition to these writers, the other most prominent presence in this Ukrainian week in Moscow is graphic artists. What an interesting choice. Why would you think of graphic artists being representative of national identity? Well, the Mikhailo Boychuk school of the 1920s, the Ukrainian monumental, monumental uh, fresco-like political art, which is involved in the creation of modern Ukrainian identity, is seen as an achievement, as something which in fact is absent in Russia. Where Russia could, could in fact, perhaps the Russian artists could take a lesson from the Ukrainians. And this is why it is included, also because of the connection to modernism. It has very few links to this patriarchal notion of little Russians dancing and whatever singing. But of course, the next time in 1936, it will be all singing, dancing, not too much literature, and the literature present in 1936 would not, of course, be a modernist one. It will be more kind of neo... Some of the neoclassics, very notably Maxim Rilsky, will be re recruited to participate in this 1966 event. Um, when the Ukrainian writers return back to Kharkiv and Kiev, they do engage in conversations with friends and colleagues about this meeting with Stalin. Of course, they're infiltrators, they're informers within this circle. So everything gets reported to the secret police. At one of those meetings, Sergei Yefremov himself is present, the most important representative of the evil nationalist trend in Ukrainian culture. I know Maxim is writing a book about him, probably. No, just given talks about him. That, that is safe, yes. <laughs> Don't go too deep into it, yes. He was an interesting character, actually, a very interesting character. Um, so, and of course the informer, we still don't know who the informer is, describing what is going on. The writer says, oh, Stalin was completely disoriented. He didn't have a clue about the Ukrainian language, didn't know about Halisha. But overall, it's not a bad signal because he said that the Ukrainian language will survive and your culture is okay and there will be no immediate assimilation, he seemed to imply, providing that you denounce your frame of Unkhvelevi and such. And of course, all of it is getting recorded, and Yefremov is sitting silent. This is my first puzzle. Yefremov is sitting silent, and the informer says, say something, please. And Yefremov utters the enigmatic phrase, a ti mark ugrai, and you mark keep playing. Neither the informer nor the secret police officers know how to interpret that. The, interpret the interpretation they venture to advance is he probably meant we should continue doing our subversive work. <laughs> and so, Ati Marko Rai, so Marko, keep playing. <laughs> That's the first puzzle. Um, and he smiled at the moment when he pronounced this enigmatic phrase. You could only imagine how many conspiracies would have been created if he were to utter one or two more sentences, how many people would end up in Siberia and such. Okay, I have, however, looking at the time, to advance to my fourth point. And this is an obvious one. 
The White Guard by Bulgakov is not a typical Stalinist play. It's actually a very strange cultural product for the dictator to pick up to make a stand. He has plenty of others at his disposal. He actually mentioned some other Soviet plays like uh, Bronypoist and Lavrenov or whatever. Uh, wouldn't bother you with that. Um, and, and also accuses the Ukrainian writers that they do not know the Russian plays, that they, are not, they haven't seen them, they haven't translated them, they are not actually following up on Russian literature, which I think is a very important signal. This is something which is going to be left in his mind. The year 1933 comes, 1934 comes, and that will become an accusation, intentionally ignoring the beneficial influence of the Russian culture. But let me go back to the White Guard. If they're Soviet plays, if they're plays by, by more reliable writers, even writers who are members of the Communist Party and such, why on earth defending the White Guard? Um, when I looked at this question in my uh, notebook, I also thought perhaps this question should be posited in a wider framework. Um, growing up in Soviet Ukraine, I haven't read this play, but I have seen the film, The White Guard, and it was a powerful film. Um, but the question then in my mind would be why would in the late Soviet Union when the allegiance to the party is declared at every level a white monarchist play be made into a film which would be shown on television over and over and over again and I think by looking at this issue in this larger framework a possible solution appears inside and possible answer at this point at least, just before you ask your question, right, um, is the dual one. The White Guard uh, is possibly useful precisely because it can allow for an articulation of a Russian nationalist monarchist identity. So Stalin can go to the play very famously. He attended 15 or 16 times and obviously enjoyed it. Is a, it is a good play, right? But it's not because Stalin was such a connoisseur of good plays, right? He wouldn't go to Chekhov or Shakespeare or anything else 15 times. It actually allowed for articulation of a Russian identity without adding your name to it. So if everybody knows that Stalin loves the play, it actually sends a signal. We can enjoy it too, and perhaps we should enjoy it. And in doing so, it sends a signal not about literature alone, but about identity, identity of the country as a successor of the Russian Empire. The civil war came and was gone. The accounts with the whites are settled. Now we can embrace this identity of Russians. But secondly, perhaps, it's also re the rehabilitation of the empire and the imperial attitude to Ukrainians. Perhaps it is precisely what the Ukrainian writers and officials wanted to denounce. Perhaps precisely that was liked by Stalin. That the play portrays political Ukrainians, not the cultural ones, the funny ones, dancing, singing, but the political ones in uniforms with rifles, officials, officers. They are presented as brutes, ignorance, uh, who are basically peasants, who have no place in a major imperial city, who should be gone, who will be gone sooner or later. Perhaps it is this message that actually appealed to Stalin in the late 1920s and early 30s. Um, and of course, we all know that the, the staging history of this play is very well researched. It was one of major topics uh, during uh, Pere Budova and Hlasnist, finding out how Stalin prosecuted Bulak, Bulgakov. But I think it's really misleading because Stalin truly defended Bulgakov, restored him twice at his job at the theater. And even so, the play was removed in 1929, not immediately after the visit of Ukrainian writers. It was brought back in 1932, at the exact time, when those very same Ukrainian writers were being already investigated by the GPU in, and about to be arrested. So Stalin remembered about the play. It was important to him. It was brought back, brought back to huge acclaim. It was made into a film in the late Soviet Union, allowing again for the audiences the benefit of, an, of identification with the empire and the imperial primacy of Russian culture as a sign of culture itself. So the, um, the belittlement of Ukrainian culture and language as something laughable, 
That, I guess, is very clear in this particular play. And now, after my fourth point, comes my second puzzle and then the two epilogues. The second puzzle is actually pretty obvious. I thought that Alexander Dovzhenko, the famous Ukrainian film director, was on this trip. He, he didn't come to Moscow with empty hands. He brought his recently finished film, Arsenal. Which film actually offered an interpretation of the Ukrainian revolution very much liked and approved by the Soviet leadership. Stalin said personally, this is true revolutionary romanticism, comrades. Dovzhenko is pleased. However, he is leaving all kinds of clues for us, indicating to, to us that in private letters, in, in, even in one version of his biography, that a crisis and difficulty in, relation with, in relations with his comrades followed the completion of Arsenal. And what it is really, that these people embracing political Ukrainian identity, embracing this notion of the Ukrainian revolution, embracing so much that Stalin has to tell them, so are you defending the Petlura fighters? And they say, no, no, not really, but they were cultured men as well, just in case. Right? So these people could not embrace Arsenal, and they did not. Dovzhenko actually suffered criticism from within the Ukrainian cultural scene, but Stalin embraced the movie. Interestingly enough, this film is not discussed in any memoirs and not too many newspaper accounts which actually focus on something else, on the writers. The film was not officially released in either Ukraine or Moscow, but it was already shown once for a private audience of uh, Soviet cultural figures and Soviet leadership in November 1928, and it was shown again during this visit, but there are very little comments on it. Very little comments on it. And it seems that both the Ukrainian officials and writers and the Soviet leadership do not have an interest in discussing it, perhaps for various reasons. Uh, they see it as actually a Stalinist version. I'm sorry for those of you who are fans of Dovzhenko. I'm a fan of Dovzhenko as well, but, uh, but they probably see it as a Stalinist version of the Ukrainian revolution. So if you look carefully at this movie, it actually creates um, literally a, a powerful representation in mass culture of a Ukrainian nationalist. A nationalist who is weak, so weak that he cannot kill his opponent. But his opponent is so strong that he can grab the handgun and actually kill the nationalists because he is too strong. Of course, there are multiple, uh, you know, biblical references. It's a it's beautiful expressionist film. There is a lot in it. There is a lot of anti-war pathos in it. It's a powerful movie. But the Ukrainian audience sees it probably, most likely, as far as we can determine, as actually the Moscow version and that's perhaps precisely why neither Stalin nor them would like to discuss it. And of course, Dovzhenko is going to move to Moscow in 1933. And he argues because, because he wasn't comfortable in Kiev in, in, in a variety of ways. His turn will come. The turn of those writers and officials is going to come in 1933-34. Yefremov's turn is going to come within a few months after this meeting. Dovzhenko's turn is going to come in 1943, when he too will be denounced, not arrested, but denounced by Stalin himself in another very rare occasion of a delegation, small group of Ukrainian writers being present in the Kremlin when Stalin walks around the table and denounces Dovzhenko on a variety of things. So this is my second puzzle, and now I proceed to my two epilogues. One epilogue is already going to be slightly familiar to you because I talked about 1936. This is the next year when Ukrainians show up in the Kremlin. They show up in a totally different mood. They have this beautiful archival and photographs of newspapers about how they now described and how the interaction with Stalin is scheduled. <laughs> so the editorial co-authored by seven major Ukrainian writers, some of them new, some of them still those who went to Moscow in 1929, actually starts with a description of a beautiful gilded hall in the Kremlin and the wonderful crystal lights and everything. But then the true sun appears. And this is, of course, Comrade Stalin sitting at the head of the table. And then listen to this. Behind him on the scene, our wonderful artists are dancing the opak. And our wonderful Ukrainian choirs are singing the folk songs. It's so beautiful. It's now the background for Stalin, right? We proceed to him as writers. We sit at the table, but we, we cannot approach him. 
Of course, you cannot. It's only the Ukrainian party leader who is going to come to us and invite us to shake hands with Stalin. Shaking hands with him is the most important thing now, 1936. Not a discussion. They have no heart for a discussion. Stalin doesn't want a discussion either. He just says, so what are you working on? Oh, okay. Well, you know, the people, the common people are the best critic. If they like your work, that would be good. And all of them then send a telegram back from the train station. We loved so much this opportunity to see the great leader. And of course, another telegram goes back saying, each of you is being awarded the order of red banner for labor, or the order of Lenin, or this or that. So it's actually a very interesting symbolic exchange of notes of allegiance and awards instead of what the meeting of 1929 was, namely a debate. The second epilogue is, of course, least cheerful. I was amazed when doing research for this text. I'm not sure what this text is. I should finish it at some point. Um, to see that one of the writers present in Moscow, Pavlo Usenko, kind of the Komsomol activist poet, who survived, by the way, because he wrote all the correct poems, um, structured his report, his published report about the 1929 meeting in an interesting way, starting with a joke. And the joke goes like that. They put all of us on the train. They sent us there. Once we exited the train, there were armed guards on both sides. There was only the corridor between the guards. And this is how they send us to Siberia. And then he switches into a serious mood says, this is what nationalists would think about Ukrainian writers going to Moscow, that all of them are immediately arrested there right, and sent to Siberia. But of course, this is not what happened, because we had this wonderful discussion, and Comrade Stalin totally gave us the directions and such. Um, he, of course, he, he would gloss over this strange meeting in which the two sides could not really understand each other. Um, and then would go on to say, and of course it ended on an even better note, because after the meeting, after we ate all these wonderful sandwiches with caviar and drank some tea with sugar, it's important to, to, to qualify back then, with sugar. That's not just tea, it's a tea with sugar. They actually put us into four cars and drove us to major factories where we were meeting with workers. And I was that late at night? Do they kept workers in some Russian factories until midnight in order to meet with some you know, strange Ukrainian writers just emerging from a confusing meeting with Stalin. But of course, this is the, the, the case of when the when, when, uh, book becomes live, right? And indeed, um, as soon as they returned to Kiev and Kharkiv, there were arrests immediately starting. In the case of the SVO, of Spilka Vizvol in Ukraine, the Union for the Liberation of Ukraine, the fictitious extension of the really existing organization, which was used for the first public show trial in Ukraine. Very few writers from this cohort end up implicated there. It's actually Yefremov and others, those who did not go to Moscow because the government knew already they will be arrested soon. And perhaps I would actually argue in, in a published version of this paper, the very visit to Moscow took place because they knew that there will be arrests soon and a major show trial featuring major writers. But these are the anti-Soviet ones, or those who are uh, branded anti-Soviet ones. The term of those people who actually went to Moscow will come slightly late. Actually, Maxim Rilsky, who didn't go because he is neoclassic, is arrested in 1930 and kept uh, in prison for some time. He confesses to everything and then released. Of course, Hrushevsky is also arrested around the same time, confesses to everything, uh, released subsequently, a bit too early. Um, but the term is going to come in 1933-34. The Great Terror comes early to Ukraine. Some of those who are arrested then would be actually killed in 1937 in Sandarmoch. This whole generation of Ukrainian culture, including Les Kurbas, including everybody else, with some very few exceptions, um, would end up dying in the Stalinist gulag in a way in which Pavlo Usenko predicted and he thought it was a satire of nationalist representations. Very few of them are going to survive, at, usually at the price of becoming you know, um, of writing odes, odes to Stalin. And it's not a metaphor, it's actually actual odes, kind of a poetic genre of extremely long rhymed poems about great Stalin and one very famous one, which I discussed in one of my previous books, um, which is co-authored by 16 major Ukrainian poets in 1944, includes a wonderful sentence in which they thank Comrade Stalin for the sun. 
which he put up there. For the light, he gave the light to the people. And there was only one survivor, to my knowledge, who came back from the Gulag ever. And that was Ostap Veshne. Ironically, the one who behaved in the most risky way during the Moscow tour. But that's because he was a satirist. He was a sketch writer. He wrote his own sketches. He was enormously popular, and he could get away with quite a bit in his sketches. He actually suggested, and it's up to you to decide whether he was serious or tongue in cheek or whatever, that Russians should be made study Ukrainian because there isn't enough in terms of translation of Ukrainian literature into Russian. So if they do not do that, then the politically correct thing would be for all the Russians to study Ukrainian because our Ukrainian literature is so great. This sounds to me like, wow, that's nationalism. You'll get arrested tomorrow. No, he will eventually get arrested. Not tomorrow. And he is going to be one of very few people who survive, who come back and continue to be one of the most popular people, writers in Soviet Ukraine. In fact, his funeral in 1956 was probably the earliest sign of destalinization of Ukrainian cultural life, when for the first time, really, people went on the streets in colossal numbers because they were saying goodbye to a truly popular writer, to the one who loved. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much.